So let me begin the presentation here. Um, we are ready. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm not going to be doing it alone. And I'm very happy that uh, one of my ex-parents that I worked with a few years ago is going to join me. Uh, his name is Mr. Prashant Kandoi, and he's the founder of Evio Private Limited. Evio is a very interesting technology startup and a business that uh, Mr. Kandoi started. It's, it's a technology service provider, and it enables other technology and engineering companies with the challenges that they face with innovating and with automating. So I think it's a very apt uh, partner for today's presentation where I'm going to be talking about the future of jobs. So I, I have started bang on time because uh, you know I'm expecting Mr. Kandori and his team to join us in about 25 to 30 minutes. So I want to cover a lot of ground in the meantime. Um, and uh, let's begin with a very simple poll. I am aware that primarily we set up the presentation today for counselors. And this is a series that we began about five, six weeks ago. And this is presentation number five. Uh, but I'm aware that there are parents and students who have joined in today. So I'm going to launch this poll. If you could identify yourself, that will help me keep it relevant for the audience. So here goes and very quickly, let's spend 30 seconds doing this. Very interesting result. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that more than half the people who have joined us today are students and counselors are only a quarter of the audience. So it's, it's going to be interesting because I had built this presentation for counselors. So I suppose that the students and the parents who are joining us today are, are going to see what it's like behind closed doors when counselors talk to other counselors, all right? So thank you for that. A um, couple of points before I go ahead. Number one is we are recording the session today and it will be available on my YouTube channel along with all the other videos from previous webinars. And point number two is I'm aware all of you have, will have great questions to ask and I'm looking forward to them. I would simply request you to post them at the end of the webinar today in the Q&A section. So having said that, let me go ahead with the presentation. So here's an interesting aspect of my life, and this is something I have conversation with students and parents. About 50% of my time goes into talking about perhaps what a student should study or what they should do in their life. So it's a very, very relevant question that me and other counselors, parents and students face. And Typically, I have seen, you know, when I ask students this question that, uh, what do you want to study? You know, the usual responses are about 60% of them will say something to do with STEM. About 15% of them will say something to do with the humanities. Around 15% will say something to do with business or commerce, finance. And the remaining 10% are the outliers who have something very different or creative to say. It's always very interesting to listen. And that's the perspective on the ground in India. I, I suspect many of the school counselors who are attending and the independent counselors who are attending today will, will justify to that. So when I ask the students, hey, okay, so you, you, know, you want to be an entrepreneur like Elon Musk or an economist like Gita Gopinath or a doctor or a lawyer or a techie or an engineer or an investment banker, you know, how did you decide you want to do this? So the first the first question, the first response I always get is, well, that's what I thought that it has a future. You know, I thought I'm going to make, I'm going to have a great lifestyle. I'm going to make money, wealth, fame, 
fortune, power, all of those things. So I'm doing it because I'm going to make it. You know. So, all right, that's an interesting idea. Other students I ask say things like, depends on my marks. Uh, you know, if I score well in school and sciences and math, then I'm going to go for STEM. And if I don't, then it's going to be commerce. And if I still don't, then it's going to be something, something else, maybe arts or something else. I don't know. Uh, sometimes some students tell me, well, I'm going to do that because my family does that. And we've always been doing that. Or a successful cousin or a successful neighbor uh, does that. And I think that's what I would like to do. I'm exposed to it. You know, I know a thing or two outside of my school about this field. Other times I, I hear from students about, well, my, my best friend said that, you know, she was going to be a CA. So I thought I would tag along. So surprising, but you know, it's the reality of how a teenager, teenager's mind works. So, you know, that's the premise. That's where we are starting. That's the mindset, you know, I mean, we are helping our students think about jobs in the future and they are basing all of their thinking on the current economic scenario and the current opportunities that they see around them. Worse yet, past opportunities that they have seen. So, at the same time, when I talk to parents, uh, they are very much interested in, well, what's a great field for the future? You know, can you tell us where the opportunities are? You know, they are more ready to listen because they have seen times changing. They have even seen the need for uh, counselors such as us to come and consult and get a sense for their child and what opportunities are right for them. And perhaps, you know, the more enlightened conversations have been with parents about where the great opportunities are because so many of them are from industry and they can see that the winds of change are blowing across the economy. Um, so, you know, that's where we are. And probably this is one of the most important questions of your life. You know, what do you want to do? Um, all right. Okay, so one quick point as a side note, I'm, I'm getting questions about this. I would appreciate if you know you can post the questions later. Yeah, thank you. So that's one side of the table. And you come to the other side of the table and you have independent and school counselors and other adults who are trying to mentor and guide the young ones about you know, what they should be doing in the future. So that involves a bit of looking into the future. And it involves at a, a student looking within. I cannot tell you how important it is that you marry both of those philosophies, that what is coming out there in the future in time. And number two, look within you and who you are truly as an individual at your core. And the better job you do of multiplying both of those factors, I think more likely you are to be in alignment with your real self in the future. So every time I meet a school counselor, you know, at a conference or visiting a school, I always ask them, how do you guide these kids you know, for the future? Because we are sitting here in our room and the world is changing around us. And it's always very interesting to hear uh, their feedback. The one thing they always say is, well, the need for counseling is going up, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, when I was a kid and there was just one cereal, and then as I grew older, there were more cereal boxes and it became harder and harder to choose which cereal was right for breakfast today. Same, in the same way, you know, the jobs are changing and opportunities are changing. And I think students and parents remain more confused about what is out there tomorrow. So I think, I think the webinar today is very relevant. Um, few months ago, I was lucky to have dinner with a college president and he said something very interesting and it stayed with me. He said, um, we are doing a phenomenal job of educating these young people for their future and grooming them holistically. What that future is, we don't know. And that, that was very interesting for me because, you know, they don't know what's coming and yet they're educating a person towards it. And, and parents are investing so much money and time and emotions into this process. So it's very important to step back and look at the bigger picture and where the world is changing 
And, and at the moment, how it's been catalyzed by COVID-19, I think the world was going in a certain direction. And I think that process is only going to be catalyzed by what we are seeing. So personally, when students come and ask me about, uh, you know, what is the right direction for me for the future, I, I very much rely on uh, my personal natural talents assessment. I'm probably one of the only people in India at the moment to assess natural talents within people that helps them identify who they are at their very core. And it's not about your personality or interests. You know, those things are definitely going to change as you grow older, but very important to identify your core talents and intelligences and, and see that what college major and what roles and career opportunities align with that. Many a times, um, you know, you may realize that that's not what you were interested in at the moment. And, and you know, it's, 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 a, it's a reality that students choose the field that they want to study at the age of 18 without not knowing too much about the world. Uh, I was revisiting one of the books I was reading a few years ago about called College Unbound uh, or something, something like that, uh, Uncollege. Um, and they were saying that it's so important now more than ever before to pause and think about where you are going. So, you know, how do we guide kids for the future? Big question. And then we see things like this, that a study from Oxford a few years ago and came out and said that, you know, 47, 50% of the jobs out there in the first world are going to vanish in the next two decades. And uh, it's nothing new, right? It's been happening forever, ever since uh, the Brits came to India and we had handloom weavers and they had uh, machines in Manchester, you know, ever since the printing press and the, the postman with email and the lift man with the automation technology. So technology has been disrupting jobs and changing society ever since the Renaissance. And it's, it's definitely happening more in the West and those winds of change are sweeping across the rest of the world. So uh, that is one very big message that stand back and watch how technology is evolving and how it is going to reshape, reorganize, rearrange our entire supply chain of how we work as society and the, the dynamics of societies both within them and between them. So, having set the stage, let me just hit a pause button and do a quick poll. I thought of a very interesting question that I wanted to put out there and I am going to give everybody a minute to think about this and pick one response, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for this. I, I'm very intrigued by these results. Uh, number one, I'm going to take a quick screenshot of this for future reference. And number two, I'm sharing the results with you. So the question was, which of these statements do you most agree with? It's almost like an SAT question. Number one, technology, artificial intelligence, and internet of things will eliminate large majority of the jobs. And only a minority of you agree with that. Uh, technology will change the nature of the job, but won't eliminate them, okay? Technology will reshape industry and society strongly, 
uh, some new jobs will emerge and some old jobs will remain. And the last one is we simply cannot predict the impact of technology and what and the impact it will have on jobs in society and what are the jobs of the future. So uh, the clear winner there, two thirds of you think that we are going to have a balanced growth. What really happens remains to be seen, but it's interesting to see that a clear consensus has come out from today's audience. I don't know if I can second this because nobody really knows exactly which way things are going to go. Uh, I mean, we remain hopeful and this is a hopeful response, but what really is going to happen, I think we'll have to wait and watch. Just like with COVID-19, we don't know how this is going to unfold. Same, similarly with technology and how it's changing the job scenario, we simply don't know what is going to happen. So uh, let's wait and watch. All right. Now. Having done that poll, let me jump back to my presentation. It's 6.46, I, I have sort of 15 more minutes. And I thought that, you know, I should share some interesting insights with you. So here is my insight number one. And this is, this is the way, so this is not put forward by me, this idea, but it's a, it's a research from the World Bank. And uh, it's a response in ways to that Oxford study. Um, you know, everybody was, relatively freaked out when that Oxford study came out and the World Bank study came out sometime later and said, while that is true, that you know a large, large majority of jobs are gonna go away on one side because of automation, innovation is the great balancer. So if you think about society, there is a seesaw that is going on between automation and innovation. And innovation leads to automation and how much automation there is in a sector or in society determines how the jobs are. So, um, you know, uh, simply thinking about innovation, we, we love here in India to talk about ancient India, and, you know, our Vedic times and how advanced technology there was. And also, when we talk to uh, entrepreneurs in India, I see very frequently them talking about the uh, philosophy of Jugar here in India. But the simple fact is that, you know, the West wins this race and they're, they're pumping billions and billions of dollars into research, into cutting edge research right, right across the board. Um, it's a result of them wanting to have military dominance. It's a result of them wanting to have technological advance, uh, sophisticated technology for their industry. Um, you know, universities in the West, uh, Europe and North America tend to get funding not just from the military and the government, but also companies and that definitely bolsters, uh, boosts their ability to be at the very cutting edge of society. And as that, uh, sorry, very cutting edge of technology, and as that technology slowly comes into the mainstream and as we are able to define processes better, things are going to automate, you know. So companies love to reduce costs. People are costs. They love to streamline processes. Uh, and, and they like predictable things and automation is going to happen as customers we like things which work and which are cheaper so it's very simple automation is the name of the game we will innovate we will automate and the balance between the two and that great seesaw is going to determine you know the kind of uh, job opportunities that we are going to see in the next decade in the next two decades so that's the first idea that i want to present to you that as counselors, as children who are thinking about the future, think of, of a sector that you're thinking about, or a job or a company or a industry, and, and think about that balance between innovation and automation. So as you think about your own life in the next few years, what is it that you see getting automated? And what is it that you see, you know, where is the innovation going to come up? And where will there be interesting opportunities? So. Um, one another study I read about said, you know, there, there's going to be a great boom in um, entrepreneurship and freelancing rather than jobs, you know, so uh, tech, large companies, medium sized companies are going to automate and deliver products and services and small individuals are going to innovate and be great uh, entrepreneurs. They are the faster moving fish and the larger moving fish, you know, they don't they don't innovate as fast. So that was another interesting part.
The second thing I want to present to you, and I, I, I'm sure the counselors are aware of this, and the industry professionals are aware of this, and students are not. Most of the students do not know what Industry 4.0 is. So if you think about Industrial Revolution, the first one was very mechanical in nature. So think of the, the printing press, you know, it was, and the one done by hand. It used to be written, the Bible used to be written by hand, and then there was the printing press, the Gutenberg press, which mechanized the process. Um, you know, and, and then it was later, uh, energy was fed into it from steam and horses and things like that. Then we went to an era of uh, assembly lines and mass production. Um, so you can think of uh, your biscuits, for example, and how they used to be made by one person or a group of people by hand. And then slowly it went into mass production and packs and packs of biscuits were rolling off the assembly line. And then came Industry 3.0, which was, you know, um, Think of the, how the Mercedes Benz is manufactured and it has an assembly line and it used to be done by hand at every stage of the process. Then the people went away or got reduced and then robots replaced them and they manufactured everything in an automated manner uh, connected to computers. And now with Industry 4.0, something very interesting is happening. We are now connecting those things both inside the factory and outside in society wirelessly uh, in a smart manner so that not just physical movement is happening, but information is flowing as well. And when we think of the internet and you hear uh, this word, uh, internet of things, it's, it's very simply, today the internet is uh, laptops and servers and mobile phones and tablets, and they're connected to each other. And the internet of things is when all the other things, all the other electrical and non-electrical goods that we see around us also connected to the internet, and so therefore, today, if I want to order a pizza from the Domino's across the street, you know, I have to order it online or on my phone and the order goes to them. And then uh, manually they have to make the pizza and manually they have to deliver it. In the future, we are looking at completely seamless, manless integration of data and product from manufacturers and suppliers straight to consumers. So, Consumers like that, things might get cheaper, things might become more available. Industry likes that, it makes it more profitable. But this is very much the future that we are already in and, and how this is going to be catalyzed by artificial intelligence and uh, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. And some predictions are very dire, others are not that uh, strong. So let's wait and see. And I think in the second half of today's presentation, you're gonna hear a lot about this. So that's the second thought I want to put in front of you uh, after the great seesawing of automation and innovation is that we are moving forward and we are now in the era of Industry 4.0, Industrial Revolution Generation 4. The third idea I want to put in front of you, and this is a personal thought, so the disclaimer here is while many of these things are results of research studies conducted by experts, the third slide I'm presenting to you is very much the personal opinions of your humble counselor. Um, and these are areas that I personally see as uh, a lot of jobs and opportunities opening up in the future. So the basic notion I want to put out there is organizations and people, if we can define what we do, then in the future, artificial intelligence and machine will be doing it. It's as simple as that. You know, if you have become stable and you can define and chalk out uh, in, a, in a standard operating procedure what you do with a lot of if-thens. AI is gonna do it, a machine's gonna do it, and they're gonna do a better job than you because they won't have manual error. Um, or at least that's the idea. Things that I think have a great future, so students who are out there listening, uh, and I know some of you have interacted with me and I've spoken about this to you in the past. And I've broken the list up into two different categories. One is STEM, which is on the top, and the second is non-STEM. So obviously robotics, I think there is no doubt today in anybody's mind that there are going to be more opportunities in robotics and, and in every single aspect of our life. And probably we are going to have robots for things that we couldn't do so far. You know, so, so there are going to be some very interesting kind of robots coming out. Um, as we become more 
tech oriented, I think cyber security is another field um, that is going to gain more traction. And obviously, we are already seeing a big requirement for this, uh, uh, you know, hackers from Russia, hackers from China, hackers from Nigeria, wanting to invade our space and trying to manipulate everything that is happening in society. So securing our digital and virtual existence is going to be very important. Obviously, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, a big trend for the future and, and such a popular choice with students who are choosing to study computer science at college. Uh, supply chain automation is going to be a great one. I, I think the way we move our goods uh, from manufacturers uh, to consumers, uh, to customers, internally, externally, outside of the supply chain, uh, the consumer supply chain, it's going to be completely automated in the future. So, um, I mean, great opportunities in the next few years in supply chain for those of you who are interested. Um, our chemistry is improving, simply put, you know, we are getting better with um, tinkering around with the hydrogen, helium and all of the other atoms. And, we need newer materials, you know, and, and uh, nanotechnology and material sciences is booming. And obviously, you know, if I'm wearing this t-shirt and it had to be dyed, right? So uh, they, they took the cotton, they fused it with a synthetic material, then they had to dye it, and then they had to, you know, produce the t-shirt. I think in the future, simply, you know, uh, newer materials will be available, which will be stronger and there won't be any need for dye and they just straight print a t-shirt or something. So I think great opportunities for those of you who are interested in chemistry, in nanotechnology, and uh, in material sciences. Obviously, that was just one example. There is so much more out there. Um, biotechnology, right? I think this is so relevant with what is happening right now. But uh, you know, our understanding of how the biological systems work at the molecular, genetic, and biochemical level is very sophisticated at the moment. And, I think applications of uh, biotechnology in food, in healthcare, uh, in industry, we, we are only just entering the realm of biotechnology. I mean, you know, when I was in college, there was this prediction that the tech era is upon us. And then after that, the biotech era will be upon us. And I can see it coming. I think those of you who are interested in research and uh, applications of uh, um, understanding biology, I think the next few decades are going to be very interesting. Already, uh, I was reading some articles about how meat is starting to get produced in the lab. Uh, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, it's better, and it's environmentally friendly. That's just one application. There, there are thousands of others. Uh, Agri-tech, right? So, I mean, this is our core industry as human beings, you know? What do human beings do? We farm. And I think the way we farm already has changed in the first world. And uh, I think developing world and the third world is only holding the fort. And before we know it, I think agricultural technologies are going to be here in a very big way. And large scale farming, corporate farming, urban farming, we are going to see a big boom in agricultural technology in the time to come. So those of you who are interested in, in that niche field, I, I think uh, full power to you. That, and so many top universities are doing research. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can think of Michigan and Cornell and Georgia Tech and Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Phen phenomenal work uh, on agricultural technology. Um, EdTech is another big, big one. And I, I think COVID-19 is probably the big push that was needed to push this cart off the hill. And uh, this was due for a long time. And I think some people are seriously looking at it right now. About can we switch to online learning? Can we switch to blended learning? You know, uh, I, I think in the next couple of decades, there's going to be a lot of innovation in uh, delivering education all the way from K to 12 to college to post college uh, in terms of online education. Um, we know the earth. I think we only know the land. I don't think we know the ocean. Um, I read somewhere we know more about the moon and Mars and Venus than we know about the ocean and what lies underwater. And uh, who knows, maybe there is aqua, right? Um, that's a joke, uh, a bad one, I guess. Um, ocean exploration, I think only 3% or so of the ocean has been charted. Um, great opportunities here as man moves in and we are going to manage fishery better and we are 
going to be more aggressive with uh, mining underwater, with uh, you know moving things underwater. Um, I think great opportunities here in ocean exploration. Virtual reality needs no introduction. I, I you know. How many of you have seen people wearing those VR sets and we are just waiting to see slowly how everything digital is going to shift into 4D, 5D with virtual reality. Cryptocurrencies and financial technologies is another big one. So uh, what is money in the future? Is it a credit card? Is it a blockchain? Is it something else digital? Already I think uh, we saw a couple of weeks ago, Facebook and Reliance coming together to launch an interesting uh, digital uh, product in the financial space. So what will be the future of banking? Let's wait and watch, but surely big moves are happening in cryptocurrencies and financial technology. We are going to space. It's very simple. We are going to space. It's, it used to be the realm of governments and now it's in the realm of the private billionaires. And whether Elon Musk goes first or Amazon goes first or Richard Branson goes first, great opportunities await us in that final frontier. Um, we are going to space, we are going to the moon, we are going to Mars, we are going to colonize, colonize things, we are going to build more state, space stations, we are going to do interesting things in space tourism. So I think lots of opportunities on that front. Uh, while we do all of those things, we seem to be doing a horrible job with the sustainability and nature. So I think everybody is realizing more and more jobs in environmental sciences and sustainability. And, and data science, right? Uh, data is the new oil, they say. So um, how we see through all of that data and make sense of it. Uh, whether it is for the purpose of research or whether it is in marketing or whether it is in finance, you know, the, again, the applications are endless, but this is something which is increasing. So, and, and, you know, if we can define it better than AI can do it. So data science is another great field for the future. Um, I realize it's 702 and uh, I can see already a couple of my friends from everywhere here. I'm just going to take a couple of more minutes, uh, talk about, non-STEM opportunities. You know, I don't want all of you to think that STEM is the only place where opportunities are. So uh, I think, you know, one thing I haven't put on there is entrepreneurship. I, I think more and more entrepreneurs need it in the future. And, and the more we have people following that mindset, the better they are going to do. And having said that, um, I mean, because of this automation, you know, we are seeing a lot of social turbulence. We are seeing that there are jobs going down or jobs moving overseas and, and because of those undercurrents, we can see that, you know, politicians, right-wing politicians, um, uh, what do you, um, you know, people like Donald Trump, nationalist policies, uh, we are seeing them across the country and across the world and, um, you know, is globalization dead? That's a big question on everybody's mind. And perhaps there are going to be lots of interesting job opportunities in peace studies and international relations. And, you know, step back and look at it. And international relations used to be the domain of governments and large international organizations. But suddenly the large corporations have uh, slowly swept in and, uh, you know, your top Fortune 50, Fortune 100 have international relations uh, departments. And, who maintain relations with governments. I mean, if you think of a company like Apple or Facebook or Tesla, uh, you know, their turnover is bigger than so many GDP of so many countries. And, and uh, you know, the way they manage their business, they have to employ people who understand international relations and maintaining relationship with countries and companies around the world. So great opportunities there. Um, one big area is mental health and well-being. So I think all of us will appreciate and recognize that um, as we go forward, more and more social disturbances are being witnessed as we modernize. And uh, across generations, mental health is becoming more and more of a serious issue. So I think it will continue and there will be more trend. Uh, more opportunities, career opportunities in healthcare and mental health in the future. So those of you who are interested in psychology, I think, I think I'm think i seeing a big boom in this, you know, across the last decade. 
Uh, urban planning is another one. Urban planning, you know, as we've ruined our cities, uh, we are not able to grow in a systematic, organized, well-planned manner. I think more and more cities and countries are going to have to switch to urban planning models. Um, design thinking is growing. Uh, you know, hospitality is growing. Uh, all of us are ready to pay more for food and hotel and travel and uh, you know other experiences rather than products. So. Definitely hospitality is on the rise. Animation, gaming, film, entertainment, more and more of the percentage of wallet of consumers is being spent on this. And the last one is a very interesting one. You know, humanities used to be very much the realm of uh, qualitative thinkers. And now in the future, it will be the realm of quantitative thinkers as we have data on a lot of behavior by individuals and group of people and across society organizations. So that, in a nutshell, uh, in an express manner, is where I see a lot of uh, job opportunities. I have exhausted my speech now, and I think we have very interesting speakers coming up. So I would like to invite Rupak. I can see him. Welcome, Rupak. Welcome, Ashish. Welcome, uh, Prashant and Anand. So great to have you, all of, uh, all of you with us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I invite uh, Rupak to, to share some interesting insights on automation with us. Thank you. Hi, hi how are you? I, I hope you don't mind feeling it for Rupak. No, I absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I believe the subject provided to me today was in terms of, uh, uh, you know, impact of IoT and AI in industry. I think Rupak has joined us. Rupak, would, yes. you, like, would you like to start just as, I mean, just put on the mic. Rupak, you'll have to select the mic. Yeah, able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I think you can continue. I'll, since you have already started, we can proceed. Fine, no problem. So uh, uh, thank you, Neeraj, and good evening to uh, everyone. My name is Ashish Shah, and I work with EBO Private Limited as the Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, our objective today is uh, to uh, predict the impact of IoT and AI. Okay. Uh, in today's world and how will jobs get impacted? Uh, well, uh, from my side, in, from the beginning of this, uh, you know, little session, I would say jobs are not going to get impacted. They're simply going to change as Neeraj had pointed out, you know, a few minutes back. The type of jobs is going to change. Okay, it is going to get more uh, domain related and uh, uh, because of which, right, the type of education that we uh, receive today Right, it has to change a bit. So, for example, uh, let, let's talk about agri tech. Okay, so agri tech would require what? It, it requires basically people who understand agriculture at the same time, we need to understand technology. Look at um, 3D printing, for example. Okay, it's, it's an area which is going to actually change how manufacturing is done today. So, uh, let's, let's put 3D printing into the agricultural space. So, I'm in a remote village, okay, and I uh, need to uh, get a spare part, right, uh, for my, uh, you know, my harvesting machine. And uh, can I actually uh, avoid all the logistics costs, right, and manufacture that spare part right there itself, right? This is this is the kind of uh, technological need, right, which will arise in, well, let's say, another decade or, or so, okay? So um, what I'll try to do is, uh, you know, I'll try to explain further as to how things are happening in the industry as far as IoT and AI is concerned. Um, this economy, right, typically will lead to the emergence, as I said, of uh, new hybrid verticals, right? So, for example, on the edge of IT and medicine, okay, IT and energy, IT and robotics, right, IT and agriculture. So, there's going to be a mix of information technology, uh, automation, right, and the traditional industries. So, it's, it's a hybrid verticals which will be created. So, hybrid industries uh, verticals, which will create jobs with which, Every business okay, uh, is already familiar, right? So it's like product managers, software developers, hardware designers, 
data scientists, okay, user experience designers, sales managers, um, other positions that will be you know quite rampant, right? Uh, include uh, say account managers, marketing specialists, uh, product designers, researchers, and uh, you know sales managers. The, these are jobs which are quite traditional. They are, already exist. The, the only difference is going to be right that we are going to actually elevate right these jobs into uh, by you know uh, capacity building right of the existing engineers. They'll have to learn more. Okay, and uh, we'll have to bring in more new technical skill sets. Right, when they patch them together, right, they'll be ready for this new world push that we are looking looking at. Um, IoT and AI based automation can also basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, allow for monotonous and unsafe jobs, right, to be replaced uh, uh, by technology and robots. Say, say, for example, we are in a in a coal mine. Okay, traditionally, right now, we send people inside the mine, right, and this is quite an unsafe uh, activity. But, uh, if we have uh, automation in place, that is, we have machines which are remotely controllable and machines which can sense and uh, deliver uh, the objective. Now, let us say that these machines, the mining machines, are sent in by themselves, right? That means that you are going to create a safe environment because there'll be no humans involved. But at the same time, those jobs that which the humans will, you know, basically leave, um, uh, uh, you know, will be uh, not not get, right? That those will be replaced by more technical people who will be seated behind the control room. These are the engineers who, instead of being on the field, I will now write, uh, go backwards. Now we'll talk about how are you going to maintain those machines. So obviously field engineers would yet be re uh, required, right? So at some point, right, there's always a need for human beings. Uh, human beings cannot be replaced, right, at every given point. Uh, I can understand in the IT industry, right, uh, or the software industry where we uh, talk about, uh, you know, uh, the natural language processing and stuff like that, where, where robots, right, can actually do a lot of human work. But these jobs were, are not traditional jobs anyways, right? So they, we are just actually, uh, uh, you know, perfecting these uh, particular elements into such positions where human beings would not be required. They were actually not required in the first place. They were required only for development. So we we are not taking away traditional jobs. Uh, there are new categories of jobs which will emerge, uh, you know, with a greater deployment of IoT and AI. Uh, I can, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, in any industry, Right, you will find that IoT has has a place today, uh, uh, whether it be uh, basically agriculture or it be mining or it be transportation. IoT is here to stay. It's all about uh, sensing, data acquisition, right, and basically analyzing that data. And once you analyze that data, what you want to do is predict, okay, uh, as to what would happen in the future uh, with the help of that data. So you can do predictive maintenance. Uh, these are areas which are again technical areas and they're newly developing areas. So uh, uh, when we talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, these are all, uh, or data science, that is, these are all interconnected subjects. And uh, where are they interconnected? So your earlier we used to do, say, electrical engineering or uh, elect electronics and communications or computer science, all these subjects are slowly merging together and you are talking about, uh, you know, uh, enhancing skill sets. So for example, kids today, right, would do, uh, electronics and communication, but would yet learn uh, software coding. So it's a mix and you're actually elevating those uh, particular uh, educational platforms. Um, <clears throat> see, one of the, uh, uh, the discussion today requires an answer to a fundamental question, right? Uh, will the deployment of IoT yeah. and, okay, reduce human intervention to such an extent, okay, that we shall make ourselves redundant. So uh, for this, I have a uh, you know very simple thing. You know, uh, the primary IoT, right, uh, which is there in the market today, is that mobile phone which is in your hand, right? It started off as a feature phone. Today, it is a smartphone. Now the word smart, right, became operable with that phone because it has got a lot of sensors on board. Okay, uh, I mean uh, you can just say uh, your camera, your mic, right, your um, say keyboard as a manual sensor. You have uh, a gyro built inside for, you know, as an accelerometer uh, positioning X, Y, Z plane positioning of the device. Uh, you have a GPS, right, which can tell you what, what location it is. You have a temperature and a humidity sensor on board. Many, many smartphones have those. And you have uh, the camera. Now you try to fuse all these sensors together. And uh, 
you take sensors which are on the field already say for example traffic signals on a road right which all are also transmitting data when those sensors and the ones in your hand they combine together they create a sensor fusion network and this basically leads to a lot of automation uh, rupak when he starts his speech later right will be talking about how automation happens and this is this is where the traditional automation is going we are connecting sensors together to automate things and and to uh, provide citizen centric services uh, so either it could be a plant manager or an operator or it could be a citizen on the road right so uh, uh, as i said you know uh, did the introduction of mobile phones okay reduce uh, you know uh, employability no what did it do it actually increased right the consumption of data it increased right the way we perform in terms of quality because we got more knowledge and faster knowledge availability uh, from the production perspective right because the knowledge was disseminated well right within a plant environment or a industrial environment right we were able to produce better and we were able to produce more right this is reduce manpower it did not okay uh, there is no study which says that because mobile phones came in right we reduced manpower we did not I, according to me it actually increased uh, the number of people the only difference was the people became more capable so iot's make you more capable they do not reduce employability uh, artificial intelligence uh, as i pointed out earlier uh, when when a robotic process basically comes in place okay say for example a a secretarial job okay or a receptionist job is taken over by a robot i agree we are going to lose jobs there right but if you are talking from a stem perspective or engineering or you know any other administrative perspective other than a very low end jobs i do not see uh, human beings being replaced uh, i'll give you an example okay just uh, this week uh, our uh, finance minister announced that uh, you know private players will be able to launch satellites with the help of isro's capabilities in india now by it was anyways a, a vision that uh, a lot of countries had india by the year 2025 shall have a complete network of satellites dedicated only to iot which means the jobs are available in in, in very large numbers for the next 10 15 years 2025 means that is that is by uh, by when the first network of satellites will be up imagine a trillion iot's talking from every nook and corner of the country talking to satellites and sending back data to us analyzed data pre analyzed data right we which we as citizens will start using and uh, we'll use it for our processes we'll use it for our day to day work and uh, to analyze and to take decisions right so uh, yeah, this means right that it is going to require a totally new type of uh, you know uh, employment i mean in terms of education as i said earlier you need to enhance your skill sets that is a primary uh, you know problem that we have on hands uh, we will have to do that right but we are not going to lose jobs and i i believe uh, our kids today are uh, very very you know uh, they find it quite easy to absorb uh, technology it's it's not like how it was i mean i i i would be uh, uh, you know uh, actually happy to share a personal experience if somebody asked me as to uh, what the operating system i use today right i use windows 7 okay and there's a reason behind it okay and, and that is that the interface okay of windows 7 versus windows 10 right is basically a you know a big change for me okay to start learning exactly where things are and uh, so that's the reason i stick with that but well uh, as i said uh, the new new world world is for the younger generation and uh, i i believe uh, employment is not going to be a problem at least for the next 20 25 years so i can't predict beyond that but that's it yeah thank you so much yeah thank you thank you those were very interesting insights and as i was listening to you you know this idea of a person being a techy and a fuzzy at the same time came you know i read this book i think scott hartley was the author and he talks right. about how the future belongs to the people who are domain experts in two fields you know not just one so it right. can be agri and tech it can be data science and iot it can be you know something with something so you have to be a fuzzy 
which is humanities and people oriented and a techie which is you know data and machine oriented at the same time those kind of people are going to do better in the future so i think you have totally exemplified that and i think also highlighted the fact that jobs are not disappearing but the nature of jobs is changing and right. the the phone example was perfect um, you know as a kid i used to we used to you know ask somebody for a way that uh, you know can you tell me where i can find this temple or this friend's house and now you simply just google map it and you can even predict like how long it's going to take to get there so i think right. you know very excited about what happens with iot so thank you thank you so much for right. that no uh, welcome rupak thank you welcome rupak over to you yeah thank you good evening to all so myself rupak so i'll just touch up on uh, automation like uh, what all the advantages and how it is done and with some few examples which i you know where i involved so basically uh, any industry from manufacturing or process and up to banking the, they are adopting new automation technologies uh, where advantage is productivity safety and profitability and quality and flexibility so considering this the future of automation looks promising where everything will be made accessible and easily available so one of the management consultant pwc uh, in 2018 they have clearly stated the new technologies will create many new jobs and these technologies will uh, boost productivity and generate income and wealth and whatever additional incomes which is generated is again uh, the get the demand for the labor and new jobs uh, this is what they have uh, stated so now let come to how to automate so there are three simple, simple steps one is u stands for understand is s for simplify and a for automate like uh, basically understand the existing process and simplify the process and automate the process so automation and robotics is uh, like is here and just like steam power in uh, 1780s and electricity in 1870s and computing system in 1960s it is like that so uh, let us get into a like products like in automation like it starts with the plc where plc supports a small micro automation very small uh manufacturing setup to a big setup and then it comes to a scada the scada is for and visualization like visualize the process and then comes to a dcs the dcs is a distributed control system which is for very big processes and then it comes to an bfd now i'll come into the detail like what is bfd and other things so let us get into the vfds like plc dcs scada and all these things are now heard about now if you in an industry generally 70% of the electrical load is motor load and all these motors are run in a very in a fixed speed but nowadays with the automation to run the motor with the various variable speed according to machine and process application it requires a drive which is called variable variable frequency drive the frequency is mentioned because the speed is proportional to the frequency and vfd play a critical role in energy saving particularly in variable torque applications like fan and pump so if you see like pumps where there is a damper and dampers are manually operated to control the flow so with the fixed speed of motor when you run a fan or pump with the fixed fixed speed then you need to vary the damper to control the flow with the variable frequency drives where you can change the speed of the motor to control the flow in a closed loop where you can sense the flow using a flow meter and you can change the speed accordingly and drives do not only gives a variable speed it also delivers smooth start and stop which reduce the mechanical impact on machines and equipments and improves the, and this also improves the power factor of the system and reduce maximum demand in a factory so this is one of the and it is uh, clearly mentioned that 50% of the automation demands are based on like 
cater to VFDs market. So, and as an ex example, like where VFDs are critically used, uh, there is an, uh, you might have heard of gearing in a system where uh, the mechanical gearing has been done. Mechanical gearing basically uh, like uh, you have a shop and so so you have a main shop and then you have multiple other shops where the gearing is done through a belt and it has a, a mechanical backlash and the positioning accuracy is also not as good as, as good. So what has been developed? Then it is called an electronic gearing. So in electronic gearing, like each shaft will have uh, its own independent motors and it is all driven by, uh, in, these motors are called servo motors because of its dynamics. And it has been driven by an VFD. And uh, these VFDs will synchronize all the motors with the required gearings. So the advantage of uh, electronic gearing is an accuracy and wear and tear of the mechanical and backlash. So what happens like if you know the printing, which is the most critical uh, application where you have multiple five color printing, seven color printings. So in these applications, this electronic gear comes into a handy. So basically now if you see here, whatever I explained, there are, uh, you are in, involving with the mechanical as an electronics. Now, now there is a new field in of engineering, which is called mechatronics as widely used in uh, robotics also. So this is a new um, invention, which is come or new branch, which has came up after an automation. So the second example, which I would like to give, which is, and the first one, which has explained is for factory automation. The second one, which I would like to give, which is a recently, we are doing a big project for a DCS project for in specialty chemicals. You know, these, uh, this company is first time getting into an automation and first time they are directly going into a DCS, not to even PLC. So the operators, uh, those who are running their plant, uh, they are not conversant with the, uh, uh, the plant, which is having a sophisticated automation system. So now we are giving a software where we, they can simulate the entire process and you can train their operator without actually getting into the process. And, but it's like a virtual simulation. So the operators, the existing operators and new operators can be trained to the full extent the, so that the, when they sit on the actual process to operate, they will not have any you know, dis, uh, difficulties in run the operation and an understanding. Besides this, uh, in the engineering stage itself, suppose a process plan for a green fuel project, they are coming up with a new process plan and without putting up an entire plan, you can design a plan on a software and you can simulate with all field elements and sensors put together and you can, uh, you can understand like what is the productivity, what is an efficiency you're going to have, what improvisation you're going to have. So these are the new trends which is coming up with the softwares. And when for a programmer, for a programmer point of view, when you write a programming, it's like you, you can do a coding and you can try that entire programming, which uh, then you can have some errors in that program. So there is another virtual simulation programming kit where he can simulate the entire process where even your field elements has been simulated. So when it go to the actual commissioning and then the plan, so he can, you know, straight away get into the programming, which is 100% tested. So these are the two examples. Uh, one is related to factory automation and another one is the process automation. So uh, the third one is like, it's a very simple application uh, where you might be knowing all pencils, you know, Natraj pencil. So we have done an automation for these company. The pencils uh, in the initial period, if you know, like when you put a pencil into a sharpener, the, the lead used to break. So uh, the people may be thinking it's maybe bad quality, then how to segregate, everything is done manually. So using 
high resolution cameras we are inspecting the pencils once it is manufactured for the centric of the lead so that you know it can when you the bad quality pencils are not not goes to the market so they do a segregation in three types that is both the ends are fine and one end is fine as far as lead is lead center is concerned so accordingly if you see in the pencil like they have back black paint on the one end so by this the productivity is going to improve and you have a quality product in the market so these are the three example which you uh, which i wanted to share i think and this is all from my end thanks thank you so much rupak um, i really enjoyed the technical detail that you provided uh, next up we have mr prashant kandoi so good evening and welcome good to see you and uh, if if rupak if i can request you to uh, stop sharing the screen yeah and then it's over to prashant ji so would love to hear your thoughts on the future and we have students here we have counselors here on how automation is impacting future job opportunities yes so i am not going to take as long as my colleagues i'm going to keep it very nice and short and sweet so thanks uh, neeraj and the idea is to envision the future as um, people as leaders and there is a lot of artificial intelligence iot machine learning which is spoken about all three of you have spoken a lot about these the challenge for companies is how do we use all these technologies and combine it with the brick and mortar industry to really make use of these technologies and make processes more efficient so the idea for management of companies would be to increase production to do processes more safely more quality so that there are less of rejections and with less of manpower these are the things that the um, companies uh, managements would be looking at while they wish to uh, merge technology with the brick and mortar the software tools available here are erp artificial intelligence applications crm and so many others on the hardware side we have automatic machines machine learning hardware tracing applications mechanized constructions for example if you look today at the speed at which the metros are being constructed across various cities in india it's mind boggling i don't think so we've seen the speed of construction um, anywhere it comes through um, through automation and mechanization we hear of china constructing a tower a 50 60 story tower in a month's time it's unbe unbelievable and when we see it on whatsapp videos uh, you know it's really happening a uh, hospital which is constructed by them in less than a week uh, we have so many opportunities in warehousing automation where we have robots going about placing of um, uh, placing of uh, all our parcels in these warehouses which stock lakhs and lakhs of items and recovering them um, so that you know when uh, flip carts and the amazons of the world promise us deliveries on the same day or the next day it comes through automation so this is the merging of um, the two um, the two brick and mortar with the technology and our company probably today ports more competitively on labor charges we do projects across the country so we port more competitively on labor than we probably did 10 years back so what i used to charge customer what we used to charge customers 10 years back for labor charges is uh, higher than what we charge today and i'm sure in 10 years the manpower cost must have gone up at least three times how do we do that i think the entire play is on speed and deliver and uh, speed and efficiency so whether it's a career in designing such solutions or manufacturing them innovation in finding new materials new approaches to reducing downtime through machine learning these are these are so there are so many opportunities and as even i learn every day there are so many further opportunities which 
are available and for students. I would now like to invite um, Anand. Anand is my son and he's just uh, minted as a fresh engineer. Um, last week, uh, he's done his engineering from Harvey Mudd uh, uh, and is a STEM student. He'll share with you all a few thoughts on what um, colleges today in the US are having a flavor of um, the um, technologies which are being taught to students and how they are helpful to merge them with real industry jobs. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, Anand. Good to see you. Hi, Neeraj. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure how helpful what I say will be, but I guess what I can tell you is my experiences at Harvey Mudd over the past four years and what I have seen and talking to my other friends at other colleges about how uh, we are being taught and how we are being imparted knowledge about different kinds of new and upcoming fields in the future. So first and foremost, uh, there are so, so many classes that you can take in college now. It's not just the general five courses options. There are at least 50 different courses that you can take every semester. Of course, you can't take 50 courses a semester, but you have those options. And um, it goes all the way in engineering itself. It can go from bioengineering all the way to computer engineering to, uh, uh, to chemical engineering. Um, you don't even need to take engineering courses to pass as an engineer because now engineering has become so much more flexible than it was in, in the past. For example, I've taken computer science courses that are completely coding based courses with like no hardcore engineering in them. And my college has accepted them as an engineering course for my uh, graduation. And so colleges are getting a lot more flexible with, with what engineering implies. And we can take a much more broad set of courses. Of course, uh, as you were talking about in your presentation, where it's not just STEM fields that are the future, there are also non-STEM fields. Uh, colleges are offering a lot more humanities courses. Um, personally, at Harvey Mudd College, since, since it's a liberal arts STEM college, I was allowed to take a lot of uh, humanities courses uh, like painting, uh, theater, psychology, philosophy. And I feel like all of those are really, really helpful in planning towards a future for our uh, civilization. Just as an example, you might wonder why are these courses important? So the future of driving is self-driving cars right now. And sure, I can know how to code uh, and make the navigation for a self-driving car. And I may have the hardware skills to build a car itself and the sensors. But you need to think of ethical questions when you make a car like that. Uh, think about philosophical questions like if you have a passenger in the seat and a person on the road and you can only save one of those two in a near uh, in, a, in an accident, who do you save? Do you save the person in the car or do you save the person on the road? And these are questions that can't just be answered by STEM courses being taken all through your four years in college. You need to take other kinds of courses to be able to have a wider breadth of knowledge. Apart from courses, there are also seminars that colleges conduct all year round, seminars that may happen once a week during lunchtime. So you can take your plate of food and sit in, uh, sit in the seminar and learn about a little bit of like IoT or AI or ML, or, and you can do this for an entire semester. Uh, there are online courses you can take. So for example, I know Stanford, for example, offers a great course in machine learning that anyone and everyone can take. Uh, I'm not sure what the course name is, but if you just look up Stanford Machine Learning, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Um, there are clubs in college that offer like-minded students an opportunity to uh, enlarge their uh, ideas and opinions about these courses. Uh, for example, in my, uh, in my college, we had a hacking club, which taught students about how to hack, uh, but positively. So I personally didn't join that club, so I don't know what it entailed, but I do know that such clubs exist. And if you have an, a great idea and you find other people, you can always form your own clubs. Um, there are also hackathons that you can attend where you meet a lot of other people 
uh, who make great great uh, devices and ideas and you can share your own ideas with them and learn a lot in the process lastly there's also research so research in college is all about 10 years into the future for example i did a uh, research in biomedical engineering with a professor where we were trying to heal traumatic brain injury that can occur and that is stuff that hasn't been invented yet and we work on things like brain cells and how brain cells might be affected if we add stem cells to them and can stem cells be changed into brain cells so that the brain can heal again these kinds of ideas and technologies are just some that the colleges around the united states and probably around the world are offering to students nowadays and honestly there's just too much being offered and it's all about how much you can grab at one time because you definitely can't grab everything that they're throwing at you yeah, yeah thank you thank you so much anand very interesting insights i'm uh, very happy to hear you had a positive experience at how we met it was just yesterday i think we were sitting in this room and you were going to college so congratulations on graduating and i think the last point that you made is uh, comes back a full circle to what i was talking about in innovation and how innovation is going to be the key as we go forward because automation is definitely amplifying as we heard from the evio team and there are going to be more opportunities in automation but at the same time it's going to reshape our society and there is going to be a vacuum for innovation like anand said in the next 10 years to fill it up with newer products and newer solutions for all of us the parting thought that i want to leave the entire audience with is education is the key if you as a student would like to have competitive advantage in the future economy having the right education is going to be the key i think it is going to be a very big difference between the innovators and the haves and the and the followers laggards and the have nots so choose your education very carefully be very mindful of the changes that are happening in society and try to take calculated bold moves with what you want to study at college and with what you want to do in life so thank you to everybody um, on the evio team thank you anand for joining us and thank you all of us for being with us i know that we have overshot by about 12 minutes uh, i would be happy to answer any questions at this stage uh, and then we'll probably close in about five to ten minutes so they're coming in all right so i can see the questions uh, a question is do you feel going undecided is better than choosing a major at the time of application process so obviously i think this is quite an ambiguous question and uh, it depends on the college you're applying to all right so there are colleges where going undecided is okay because you may be able to switch into a major of your choice later and then there are colleges out there uh, i'm talking about in the us and then i'll give a response to non us as well uh, in the us where you may not be able to switch into the major that you are interested in just simply because how competitive it was so i think you will have to do some research on that before you decide to go undecided and obviously i think if you're talking about non us colleges i think the vast majority of them expect you to know what course you want to go into so i think going undecided is simply not an open possibility for um, many many non us colleges okay the next question is will the paradigm shift which which is in high support of technological advancement advancements unconditionally give rise in demand for more primitive jobs like handloom or even ayurvedic medicine absolutely i i think you know there is going to be a kickback from society and we are obviously all uh, going to have uh, a demand for more niche products right so you can see what has happened you know people have become more interested in organic food and ayurveda for example so i think there's definitely going to be more opportunities for traditional uh, uh, sciences and traditional uh, products and services and i think it's because of greater awareness you know which has uh, people have been empowered by the internet so greater awareness is going to lead to more opportunities in those fields although even if you are in those fields you are going to feel the effects of automation and artificial intelligence okay um uh, another question is how could the future of finance be affected by technology i think this is 
such a beautiful and such a broad question. I, I try to remind myself what it was like uh, thinking about money for my ancestors. You know, probably they thought of cash and gold, and then their children, my parents, my grandparents, started thinking in more interesting ways about personal wealth and finance. And I, I don't know what they would say to something like a credit card. And you would tell them that this is money, you know, and, and this is online banking. And, uh, you know, here is PTM. So can you imagine if we just go behind, go backwards 20 years and into the year 2000, just 20 years. And how many people were doing online banking? Or how many people were using credit cards? Or how many people were doing PTM and how that's changed society? So... I think if you just fast forward the clock 20 years, uh, I think there are going to be some phenomenal changes in the financial sector, the banking sector, insurance, and, and just end customer and how they think about money and what they think money is as well, you know. So, um, I mean, people are investing in cryptocurrencies, right? So, so I think just there are so many changes, I cannot even begin to um, <laughs> list all of them. Okay, um, lots of other questions coming. Can you, can the field of peace and international relations stay unautomated? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. I, I'm so glad you asked that. That's a, such an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. And, um, I suppose, you know, time will tell. I don't really have an answer for this. Uh, I, I know that it's going to become more important as we go ahead because of a lot of social and political turbulence in the world. How is technology going to affect that remains to be seen. I mean, one simple example right now is uh, involvement of individuals, organizations and technology companies in the election process, in, uh, you know, in cyber attacks. We, we are seeing that technology and international relations are merging together. So, Will it be automated? I don't have an answer for that. I suppose not, but time will tell. Okay, my God, so many questions, I'm being bombarded. Um, how can the future of pets and taming animals be affected by technology? Okay, I, I definitely, veterinary medicine is getting uh, more and more digital. Uh, I, I don't think I am an expert on answering this question, so I think I'm going to I, uh, defer that and perhaps if you get in touch with me later, we might be able to discuss that. Um, I'm seeing more and more professionals turning to yoga as a profession. These are young men and women who are in this field. Yeah, definitely. I, I think so. So uh, I did speak about mental health and wellness, right? So. We never patented it. Uh, as India, we never uh, IP protected yoga. I think we gave it freely to the world and moments took it and rolled with it. So um, we have seen all kinds of variants of yoga. I, I think this is a trend which is only going to increase. You know? So uh, is it going to be a full-time career for you to become a yoga professional? Is it going to be something you do on the side that you will have to decide? And but definitely, I, I think the number of people who are becoming professional, uh, you know, meditation coaches or yoga coaches, it sits on the rise and it will continue to rise. Digital humanities. I, I love this question. I think digital humanities fascinates me particularly because, you know, when, when you spoke to humanities professors and students in the past and what they thought uh, about humanities and when you talk to them right now and talk to them about the future, I think there has been a very big paradigm shift in how humanities is studied, assessed, uh, discussed, and communicated. So how are people feeling about electing a certain leader used to be done offline? And I think that whole conversation has greatly been affected by all the insights that digital data is providing. So, uh, you know, how frequently is the word Modi being said or Rahul Gandhi being said, you know, you can study that in digital humanity. So it's simply the study of people 
in the digital space. We have a lot of data coming in from so many sources and to understand trends and relationships in that. And um, I mean, what is Facebook if not digital humanities? You know, what is social media if not digital humanities? Uh, our entire uh, communication has shifted into this digital virtual space. So, I mean, there are so many opportunities here and, and even technology companies love hiring uh, humanity students who have a flair for digital sciences. Um, okay, next question is, how will the future of psychology and behavioral studies change as compared to now? I think, I think there are two big trends affecting them. Number one is our understanding of the brain itself is changing very fast. And I think, uh, like Anant was giving us an example, you know, about uh, fixing brain trauma. So there are a lot of developments in the biology side of it. Um, there are a lot of developments in the technology side of uh, how we are engaging with each other um, and with information digitally. So I think that's the macro trend you need to look at, you know, A, our understanding of biology and the mind is changing and B, our behavior around digital life is changing. And I think the overlap of both of those and those trends are, are going to shape the future. Specifically, future opportunities, I, I don't think I'm qualified to comment on that. Okay. Um, is, is the area of game development too competitive for a significant income, especially since the maximum ethical price of game has not changed for years, even though inflation, absolutely. I know that there are, a lot of challenges in the gaming industry um, and, uh, you know, gamers and game developers are not getting paid enough. And, uh, but yet, I think if you're somebody who's interested in this field, you know, there are going to be a lot of opportunities, not just to get employed, but also opportunities for you to uh, freelance and opportunity for you to come up with uh, interesting things. You know, we have seen the rise of... Uh, YouTube celebrities and digital celebrities and I suspect in the future we are going to see the rise of the freelance game designer you know who builds a game and is able to launch it online and thousands and thousands of people download their game and they earn a, a small sum from every user that downloads it so I mean if you're somebody who's interested in this there are definitely a lot of opportunities simply look at the fact that it's it's become more democratic uh, you know, playing games, the, the base of uh, who plays games has increased and people are ready to pay more for games and what they do within games. Okay. Um, okay, more questions. All right. Um, okay. Uh, can you throw some more light on environmental sustainability? And that's the last question I'm going to take. So more and more jobs showing up in the field of environment. So A, more investments are going into this space. So energy generation, if you talk about renewable energy, I think there are going to be more jobs in that sector. I think if you talk about cleaning up the environment, there are going to be jobs, more jobs in that sector. I think if you talk about uh, water and water processing, there are going to be more jobs over there. I think if you talk about waste management, it's one of the golden areas, you know. Uh, if, you, if you analyze Bill Gates' portfolio, he's got a significant portion to waste management companies. So, um, and how we process our waste and how we are able to, um, you know, recycle a lot of material there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities in that area so i mean this is a huge field for the future right so uh, financial implications of it social implications of it technological implications are going to be very big so if you're somebody who's interested please go ahead there are there are fantastic opportunities and i would say that probably the better education you can seek is in europe particularly in Northern Europe, in Germany, Netherlands, and Scandinavian countries. Uh, US organizations tend to be um, not as neck deep into it as the Europeans. So, so I, I would suggest you shift your focus to Europe for, the, for educating yourself in environmental sciences. 
Okay. Um, all right. I, I think I'm going to close it there in the interest of time. It's 7.55. Thank you so much, everybody, for sticking around. Um, those of you who are connected to me, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach me. For everybody else, thank you so much for being with us here today. I hope you have taken away some very interesting thoughts. I, I have definitely learned a thing or two. And uh, this video is recorded and it will be going up on my YouTube channel if you want to revisit it later or share it with your friends and family. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. See you next week.